Hey there, welcome to New Day Online. My name is Pastor John, and I hope you're doing well today. I know this is a crazy season for so many people, and so uh, whoever you are, wherever you're at, whenever you're watching this, thank you so much for being a part of this with us today. Uh, I believe God's Word is going to bless you today because God's Word never returns void, and it's always good. As we start today, I wanted to start with something really interesting that I saw on Facebook this week that I thought you might think was interesting as well. My friend shared this graph, and it was this organization that put out this chart that uh, basically contained the different political uh, spin bias of all the different news organizations. And so on the right side, obviously, you had the organizations that kind of leaned more right or conservative and how they reported news. And on the left, you had the more liberal or left-leaning organizations and how they report the news. And of course, um, you know, there was a bunch of organizations across the spectrum. Some were really far right, some were kind of right, some were really far left, some were kind of left. And, uh, but there were some that were actually right there in the middle. And there was one, interesting enough, that was like smack dab right in the middle. And I was like, oh, I want to know what that is. And I bet you want to know what that is, so I'm going to tell you today. Uh, so I clicked on it and I zoomed in, and I'm happy to report to you that the most unbiased news organization that you can find that will always tell you like it is, is the Weather Channel, <laughs> which I thought was really kind of funny. Um, so if you want the facts with no spin, you can always check out the Weather Channel and they'll tell you if it's gonna rain or not. And yet, though we all know like some organizations are more like conservative and some are more liberal, what I would argue is that they all agree on, on one thing or they all share one thing in common and that's this. They just primarily, especially in this season, only report bad news. <laughs> There's a lot of bad news right now, and that just seems to be the focus, and maybe that's a reflection on us as a people, but whatever it is, when you turn on the news or you get on social media, it just seems like a bunch of bad news. And even as Christians, there can be a temptation for us to fall into that pit, you know, and to buy into all the negativity and the fear and the frustration. But what I want to tell you today is that whenever you follow Jesus, uh, you can't be like that because we are called to be a people of good news. The message of Jesus, in his words, was literally the gospel, which means the good news. <laughs> and so in his own words, he came to bring a message of good news because God is a God who does good things. We are a people of good news. And as Christians, we are people, I want to proclaim this over you today, who believe what the Bible says over what the culture fears. That we are people who believe what the Bible says over what the culture fears fears. And we are called to be a people who are eternal optimists because we know that God is good and we know how it ends. And so we always have hope in that no matter what the present moment looks like. And so we've been in a series simply entitled Good News. And so the series is called Good News, where every week when you gather with us, we're going to give you some good news. And my sermon today is really blunt, really direct, and I love it. It's simply just this, God is glorious. I have good news for you today. Yes, the world's broken, but let me tell you this. God is glorious. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me right now to Psalm 145. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 here in a moment. Psalm 145, verses 1 through 9. And as you're turning there, uh, I think what we all know is the world is broken. It's messed up. There's evil, and people are angry about it. People are fearful. And we're looking out into the world, and we don't like what we see. But the question is, okay, we don't like what we see. There's bad stuff. The question is this, where do we turn? And the problem is, is it's almost like we, let's be honest, we keep waiting for either the world or humanity or the government or, or even maybe ourselves to like finally get it together. Yeah, we just need the world or the things to finally kind of get it together, but that never seems to happen. And so eventually what I want to argue is at some point we have to say maybe we need to look somewhere different. There's this really profound quote by a guy named Bruce Marshall who's a Christian author, and he says this, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. I think that's a really good way to think about the world so often and even kind of how we live our lives sometimes is it's like we're, we're seeking something and we're seeking perfection and we're seeking goodness and we're seeking justice and we're seeking love. And yet so often all the places that we're seeking it don't deliver in the end. And it's almost like we get to the point where like we know these things that we're seeking, that they won't uh, bring us the satisfaction that we long for but we feel like, well, but, but we have to pursue something. 
And yet what I want to tell you today is that what if your frustration and your despair are actually something that are meant to lead you to what really is good? And, and, and what if what your frustration is telling you is this world isn't it? You're like, well, I don't like this, or this is bad, or people are messed up, or the government's messed up, and all these things where it's like, well, all these things. And, and, and what if it's like, yeah, those things can't fulfill you or satisfy you. Now go find the good thing that can. And what I want to tell you today is that that is exactly what Psalm 145 shows us. Psalm 145 lays before us the thing that can actually change our life, that we're actually looking for, that can actually bring us satisfaction, that actually makes all things work together. Psalm 145 in the Old Testament from King David lays this before us, and we are invited today to feast on this and to find what we're looking for. The sermon today is called God is Glorious, and what's interesting is a lot of times the word glory is a really churchy word, that we use it a lot. God is glorious, or we say we should live for the glory of God, and we use that word glory, but so often we don't even know what that word really means. It's like a churchy, Christian-y kind of word that we just throw around, and we know it means something kind of good or wonderful or whatever, but we don't really know its origins, and when you know it, it's really cool. The word glory comes from the word uh, radiance, and so uh, the, the word glory, uh, one of the best illustrations I ever heard of it, uh, when you think of glory, it's almost like goodness that is manifested in an undeniable and almost in like an intense kind of way. And so an example would be like whenever you like take something and you light it on fire and this fire is like beautifully raging, if you will, you could say that it's glorying. That when the fire is burning, it's, it's glorying. It's like this, this intense raging goodness. And that's what the word glory means. And so when we say that God is glorious, what we're saying is that God is ragingly good. That, that the Bible says that the word holy is like the perfect explanation of, of God's nature, that he's different and he's all good. But the word glory is almost like when his holiness is so clearly manifested in the world that we see it. So when we see like the, the mountains or the ocean or creation or any kind of beauty or, or, or God's perfection, when it's really demonstrated before us, that's his glory. And that's why in the Bible, when it says that we, um, we, we're a light in this world and people should look at our lives and give glory to our Father in heaven, it's because they're seeing it before their eyes. And so in Psalm 145, David lays before us the glory of God. And the Psalms are such a treasure for us here in the church because the Psalms are these like prayers and songs in the Bible. A lot of them are written by King David who wrote our Psalm today. And... Um, they're just like heart checks for us all. They're these amazing kind of devotional songs and prayers and hymns to God. And it's kind of an opportunity for us to say, man, does, does my heart sound like this? Does my devotional life reflect this? And, and God's not trying to like condemn us in this. He's saying, hey, listen, if, if this doesn't match like your worldview or how you see things or, or kind of what your devotional life is like, it's like God's saying, hey, listen, there's more. Come, come get this wonder. And so as I, I read this today, may, may our prayer be that our devotional life, our relationship and love for God, that it would be reflected like King David writes here. So I'm gonna read this for us, Psalm 145, verses one through nine. Um, either read this along with me or, or just close your eyes and just take these words deeply in. This is King David writing a prayer of worship to God. He says this, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever." and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. That means I will think deeply. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. 
May God bless the reading of this word today. Wow. <laughs> God is glorious. There was a study that I, uh, I read a couple years back, and it was, um, it was a study where they were trying to like, prove like, scientifically if uh, actually looking at the mountains for an extended period of time or looking at the beach and just its beauty, if it was like, truly good for like, your mental health. And, you know, because I think there's this cliche that we think that, like, oh, I, like, you know, I love the mountains, or I love the beach, and it's good for me, it's good for my soul. We kind of have that, that thought, but we're like, okay, can you actually prove that? So the study was really fascinating. They took a group of people, and they, um, like a control group or whatever, and they had them look either at the mountains or the beach for an extended period of time. And then there was another group that they surveyed that had not done that. I guess maybe they were just in a cubicle all day or something. And they gave them a survey. And it was true, I mean, like we assume, it was true that the people who uh, spent a dedicated time focusing and looking at either the mountains or the beach uh, reported higher levels of uh, improved mental health as well as higher levels of happiness. And it's kind of cool to have that like confirmed or whatever, but I think that's so fascinating how like we know that somehow like what we look at impacts our inner life. Like that's incredible and, and it's true. And I recently experienced that uh, a few weeks back where we were having dinner in the backyard and like the kids went inside and I was outside by myself. It was like a rare moment by myself as a parent. And I remember looking up at the sky and it wasn't even a particularly beautiful day or anything, but I could see the sky was like partly cloudy. And of course, everything in me wanted to grab my phone or go do something or, you know, go talk to my wife or something. But, but I just kind of sat there for a moment in the stillness and I, I looked up at the sky and I just kind of, meditated on it. And I could feel my inner life becoming happier. And it was like a long time since I'd actually experienced that big of like a mood swing, like, like to where I could notice that I was experiencing it in that moment. And it's just incredible that, that what we focus on can really change what's happening inside of us. And sometimes I even wonder if the reason why the sky or the, the mountains or the oceans or the stars, if, if the reason why those things are so life-giving to us is because those are the things that have been the least tainted by humans. <laughs> that they're the things that really hearken us back to like when all things were truly good before sin and brokenness entered the world. And I, and I love that because I think that's what Psalm 145 is for us. Like, this is such an amazing psalm. These nine verses in the Bible are so powerful because they have really nothing to do with us. <laughs> it's not really about you. It's not about me. It's a psalm that's just all about God and his glory and his beauty and his goodness. And it's like laid out before us. And it's like God is like, come feast and enjoy this. And if you're like me, I think sometimes we're all tempted to kind of just make our faith all about us. And our whole relationship with God becomes all about us. And even when we serve God, it's kind of all about us. It's like, you know, um, I come to God because I want to, you know, have good things happen in my life or I need help in my life or I want to accomplish great things with my life. And it's all kind of all about me, all about me, all about me. And almost like we're kind of using God to have a good life or, or using God to get to a place where we feel good about ourselves. And yet at the end of the day, the Bible in life, it's really all about God. And God made us so that we could ultimately enjoy him. And when we put ourselves or even this world at the center of everything, we don't find the good that we long for because the good is only ultimately fully in God. And the problem that we have is that we, we always tend to focus on this broken world and all the bad stuff and it, it gets us down and it makes us angry and, you know, and, and there's all these problems in, in the world and, and yet they're not supposed to make us despair. They're actually meant to like kind of redirect our focus ultimately to God. Like we long for good in this life and we look out in the world and we don't see good. But what that's supposed to do is not, not just be like negative about that, but okay, but go find what actually truly is good. And I think the reason why we're drawn to David in the Bible and, and just so many of his Psalms is because David had the great courage in his writings, we see this, to look beyond the world and to look solely to God. 
David is known for writing the famous Psalm 23. And, and so often we're tempted to think that David is like this amazing person that has some kind of spiritual superpower that like you or I don't have. <laughs> you know, he has this amazing relationship with God. It's devotional and we see it in all the Psalms and it's amazing and it's awesome for him. But like, you know, I could never have that. And yet whenever you read the Bible, what you realize is David had all the same problems that we all have. He sinned. Sometimes he didn't trust God. He didn't have some kind of spiritual superpower that you don't have or that I don't have. What, what David had was that he knew God. That David was very familiar with God. That that's actually what made David unique. That what made David special was he was a, a man at peace in the chaos because he knew who God was and because God was ultimately his rock. I want to ask you a question today. Are you really familiar with God? Like, are you more familiar with God than the news? Are you more familiar with God, would you say, than your worries? Are you more familiar with God even than your spouse or your best friend? I was recently online and I saw that uh, MySpace still exists. I don't know if you remember MySpace. It was like before Facebook, like the original like social media thing where you could have like a profile and connect with people and all this cool stuff. And I was on there and I was, I was reminded that back in the day on MySpace, they had this thing called top eight where like on your profile, you could actually list like your top eight friends. It's like, this is my best friend, this is my second best friend. You could like rank your friends. Trust me, it caused a lot of drama. It wasn't a good idea. That's probably why Facebook didn't copy that feature. But I was looking at that and I was thinking, man, if we were honest, like, and we were to rank what we're most familiar with or most devoted to in this life, like would God really be number one? I think what David shows us so clearly here is that, man, if, if God really is our great focus, if we know him better than we know everything else, more than our fears, our struggles, our worries, all these other things, that we will be able to find peace in the midst of the chaos. What you see all throughout the Bible is the way you find peace is always the same way. Come to God and trust God. And David demonstrates that here. But ultimately what David knows and what David tells us here is that God is glorious. So here's the problem. Listen, yes, the world is broken. It's messed up. There's evil. There's sin. We all, so there's not just some bad people. We're all bad people. We all fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. We're, we're either self-righteous because we think we're better than people or we have to all admit like we've all got problems and failures. And so all of government is people, so that's going to be flawed too. All ideas in this world come from people, so that's going to be flawed too. And so th this world is broken, it's messed up, it's the result of sin in the world, the Bible says, people rebelling and ignoring God. Like, so, so all that is there, right? The world's broken, we know that, but the question is, what is good? And the answer we see in Psalm 145 is this, is that God is good. And so today, for, for the rest of our time together, I'm just going to give you five things from Psalm 145 that are just five glorious facts and realities about God. And as we dive into this, I want you to stick with me because what I think is going to happen as we go deeper and deeper into the nature and character of God, not think about us or not think about the world around us, but just about God, what I think God is going to do is he's going to begin to show you that he alone is good and that he is satisfaction and that he is peace. And, and he's going to draw us to his nature and be like, wow, God is good. And it's going to change our mindset and change our life. And so God is glorious. Five glorious things about God. The first one is in verse one, Psalm 145, verse one. He said, David says this, I will extol you. I love that word extol. <laughs> we got to bring that word back. It means to praise enthusiastically. David says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. The first thing about God that is glorious is that God is the good King. What David shows us here is that God is the good King. And I love this because David has such good perspective in this moment. Because think about it, this is King David in the Bible. And remember, he's the one of the what? Of Israel. He's the King. And so David is a king in his day. Can you imagine if you were like a king? That would be an interesting experience. He's the king of Israel. And yet the king says that God is my king. He says, I will extol you, my God and my king. That David knows who the real king is. And I think one of the most assuring doctrines in the Christian faith is that God is sovereign. And maybe if there's one doctrine that, that we're forgetting in this season, one true belief from the Bible that, that is meant to guide us in this life, it, it might be this one, that God is sovereign. 
when I reflected on that this week, I was like, like it, it brought like relief to my soul. <laughs> you see, in a land or in a kingdom, who has all authority? The king. And so when we say that God is sovereign, what we're saying is God is the king over the universe. In Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. And so, yeah, we make decisions and we decide things, but ultimately it is the Lord who determines somebody's steps and what happens in their life. We must remind every single fear, every single worry, and every single person that we interact with that God is the good king that God brings good in this life, that God works things out. But yeah, God does allow bad things. Like we can't deny it, that's in scripture. But that all things, even bad things, are a part of God's good plan of redemption. And this is the reason that we actually worship God because he is truly a good king. And um, just to be very transparent, and maybe you've actually, I bet a lot of you have probably thought this, but you've maybe never felt like you could vocalize it. Um, maybe especially if you're, if you're new to church. When I was in high school and I got really serious about my relationship with God, um, and I remember I'd go to church and they would be like, oh, they, they would tell us like, praise God or worship God or, you know, lift your hands and, you know, worship him. Or I'd read the scriptures and it was like, you know, worship God, like tell him of his goodness. You know, you read a lot of that in the Bible. And uh, I remember being in high school and, and like asking myself the, the question, I'm like, is God like insecure? You ever thought about that? Like, is God insecure? Like, like, why does God tell me to like worship him? Like, does he need me? Like, he, like I remember I was in high school, I was insecure. I was like, I needed people to tell me that I was like, you know, good or pleasing or, you know, like I was insecure about looks. I was, I mean, I, I'm still insecure about a lot of things, you know? But I was like, is God insecure? Like, is that why I have to like worship him and tell him how good he is? Is because he's insecure and he needs me to like build him up. And yet as I uh, was discipled and as I studied the scriptures more, what, what I learned is that God does not ask us to worship him or to glorify him because he's insecure and needs your words. He doesn't need that, right? He can create the universe without you or me. He doesn't need our words, right? But the reason why God tells us to glorify himself is because God would not be glorious if he didn't tell us to glorify him. And so what I mean by that is like, if God truly is all good, and he's perfect, and he's loving, and he's just, and he's merciful, like you should praise and worship that. And so when God says to worship me or to bow down before me, what he's saying is I am glorious and I am what you need. And if you don't worship me, you don't get it. And so the reason why we don't worship people is because we know all people are flawed and sinful. And so it wouldn't make sense, right? Because I'm worshiping you like you're everything, but you're not because you're flawed and I'm flawed. And so it's amazing. It's almost like mind blowing that like that God has to tell us to glorify him because he is worthy. Of it. He is truly the good king and he is sovereign and he is good. And so if we really understand that in his goodness and, and if we really receive all the benefit of that, we will glorify him. That's why the Bible says that he is worthy of praise. Listen, in church, we don't praise God and we don't worship him out of religion or because we have to or because it's what we're like, the right thing's supposed to do. Literally, we worship out of a genuine response to who God truly is. Worship is not about religion. It is about a genuine response. I like, know you are glorious. You do save me. You do help me. You do heal me. Man, and if I don't worship you and if I don't praise you enthusiastically, then, then I don't really get it. That God truly is the good king. And we worship him because he truly is. He says, I will bless your name forever and ever because you are the good king. And I think especially right now in this world, I think what's, what's really important is for us to be very clear that God and in the fullness of Christ Jesus, that, that Christ is the king. Because what's happening in our world right now and there's a, a pastor named Mark Sayers who writes this in a book. And it's, it, to me, it's maybe the most prophetic sentence in our world today as to what's happening in the world around us. Feel like, man, what's going on in the world? Like, what's happening, you know? It's like, we want all this change and all this societal stuff, but we can't ever seem to, to get it, right? 
And Mark Sayers diagnoses it in one sentence. And if you get one thing out of today, it's probably this. You need to write this down. Um, remember this because this will blow your mind. Because I'm like, this is everything right here. This is the problem. He said, the problem with modern society is this. We want a kingdom without a king. <sighs> Woo! We want, is that not true? We want a kingdom without a king. Like that's it. That's what's happening in the world today. We want a kingdom. We want good, we want this perfect society, but we don't want a king. But how do you have a kingdom without a good king? Like you ever been at work and you know, you're in a meeting and there's all these really good ideas, you know, oh, we're gonna do this, oh, we're gonna do that. Oh yeah, that's a good plan, yeah, we're gonna do this, right? What do you have to do to make sure that actually truly happens? It's like, okay, so who is responsible to lead that? Like, like who's, who's responsible for this thing? Who's gonna be the leader? Who's gonna execute? Who's gonna make sure this gets done? And you assign somebody to lead it. You have to, you have to have a leader. <laughs> and that's what's happening in the world today is like we want this amazing, perfect, just, fair, loving, merciful, compassionate society and everyone says they want that, but the question is, okay, yeah, who's going to lead that? Who's going to be the person who's perfect, who's all good, who's always loving, who's always compassionate, who's never made a mistake in the world, that's going to lead us into this really good place? It ain't going to be me. It ain't going to be you. It ain't going to be the right political party. If we want a kingdom... We need a king. And the problem is the world is looking out at a broken world and, and what we're really raging against is there is no king. Because the true king is Christ. And the true king is laid before us right here, but we ignore God's word. We think we don't need God or we don't need to deal with that kind of stuff. But then we try to do all this stuff in the world and it doesn't work. And then eventually either we just get frustrated or we give up or someone else gets into power and they're just as bad and someone else gets into power and we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And what David is saying here in Psalm 145 is literally, this is that king. So God is glorious. He is the good king above everything. Verse two, David goes on. He says, every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. What David is saying here is that God is good all the time. The key phrase here is every day. He says, every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And listen, David had some really bad days. And you can read about it in the Old Testament. He had some really bad days, some really bad situations. He made mistakes and other people wronged him. David had some really difficult days. And yet that man can say, every day I will bless you and the reason is because no matter what the day or the future brings, God is always good and always doing good. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here's the amazing thing, and here's the secret to always worshiping God and always having the right perspective, is that we root our life in who God is and not in what happens to us or our circumstances in this life. See, that's why sometimes like, you know, you're like, man, how come some people when they show up to church or like they're always able to worship God? It's like, do they never have any bad days? You know, or, or, are they never struggling? Or that person that's like always happy in the Lord? It's like, do they not have problems like I do? Like, how come they're always like that? And the answer usually is because that person is their worship and their joy is truly rooted in who God is, which Hebrews 13, 8 says never changes more so than their circumstances. And so when you look at David and a lot of things that he went through, but he's able to say, every day I will bless you, your name forever and ever, it's because his worship we see here is rooted in his name. It's rooted in God. And listen, no matter what the toll is of coronavirus, God is God and God is good. And no matter if you ever reach that dream or not, or get married or not, or have kids or not, or however many years God has left for you on this earth, man, our worship can't reside in those things because it'll be up and down, but our, our worship must always be rooted in 
God. And if our worship and our life is rooted in God, then we can say like David says here that every day I will bless your name and praise you forever and ever because my worship is rooted in your name, in God. We bless God every day and we worship him because our worship is a response to who God really is and not how we feel. And I also love this verse, how he says, I will praise your name. I love this. Forever and ever. Like David is saying, forever isn't enough for me to describe like how much I need to worship you and how much I want to worship you and how long I will worship you. I will praise you forever and ever. (laughs) And I love that because it also reminds us and, and begins to reorient us around the reality that, you know, God is eternal that God is eternal and we will eternally dwell with him if we are in Christ, if we've given our life to Christ, if we believe in his gospel, if we turn to God, we will be with him forever and ever. And probably for some of you, you're like, oh yeah, eternity, I forgot about that. I've been so caught up in this world and the circumstances and all the situations and all the fear of people. Like, oh, oh yeah, we're, like, we're not running out of time. I'm not wasting my years. I'm eternal. This life is but for a moment and then we're with God forever. Like that is true. That's in the word. And we can handle the things that are temporary because what is eternal is God and God is always good. Go down to verse three. This one just blows my mind. (laughs) So God is the good king. He's glorious. God is always good. He's good all the time. He's glorious. It's raging goodness. Verse three, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Great is the Lord and greatly to, to be praised. So once again, that's go, almost go back to like our first point when we talked about how like God tells us to worship him because he's truly worthy of it. So he's, he's greatly to be praised. We don't just praise him because we're supposed to. We, we praise him because he really is good. Like it makes sense to praise him. But then he says, and his greatness is unsearchable. So number three, God is endless goodness. God is endless goodness. Let me blow your mind. So that means this. There is always more greatness about God than you've yet to realize. So his greatness, all the good things about him, all of his good nature, all of his perfection, it's literally unsearchable by our finite minds. And so think about this. There are amazing realities of God and who he is and what he has planned that you currently have no idea about yet. There are great things about God that you don't know, but one day you will know. So there are things that are good that you don't know right now, but one day you will understand about God and his glory and his wonder. But then also, get this, there are great things about God that all you can know about them is that you will never know them. Like there are, like, like, like we will never be able to fully comprehend God because his greatness is unsearchable. It's like the, how the universe is constantly expanding. Like it doesn't stop. You never reach the end of it because God is endless goodness. And so every time we, we come to God, that there's, greatness to behold and to understand that there's new things to contemplate and new good things that he has planned for us and new good ways that we can like there's there's never an end to his goodness and and the, the this world is so broken and we look at it but but god is is just endless goodness goodness nonstop and and the problem is like even as i'm preaching this like it, it's so hard to preach this because i'm aware that i can never express how good he is like, he like, like, I can't do this right. I can't preach it in a way that you're like, oh my gosh, I fully get it because you can't fully get it. So every sermon's gonna fall short. Every communication's gonna fall short. That we have to live our lives and all of eternity knowing that every sermon, every encouragement, every biblical truth that was ever communicated to us and encouraged us, at least our comprehension of it and, and that changed our life, that it fell short of how good God really is. Not because God fell short, but because we are man and we cannot fully comprehend it all. That God is an endless ocean of goodness that we will have eternity to swim in. And wherever you're at, there's more. 
There's more of God's goodness and his nature. Even his word, it, it, it's so big. It's so, there's so many truths about God and facets to his nature and they're all holy and they're all perfect. And they're, you can see it from a million different angles and his perfect plan and his, his good commandments that we live into that produce good in our lives. I mean, there's just endless goodness in God. Because God is glorious. Wherever you're at today, there's more. See, the world lives from a place of discontent and lack. The, the world is always focused on their lack and what they don't yet have. They're always pursuing something. So it's always about what they don't have. And yet for the Christian, every day is like Christmas morning. When you're a Christian, every day is God giving you more and more of his goodness and he's speaking to us and he's walking with us. And if we will walk with him, if we will open up the eyes of our heart to him, we will see what he's doing, but we will never fully comprehend all of it for all eternity. God is glorious. He's endless goodness. Then going on to verse four, I'm gonna read verses four through seven. As if it couldn't get any better than that. He says, one generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. David says, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And I don't know if you ever thought about this, but we see this in different places in the Bible, but we see it specifically right here, that God's goodness is generationally transferable. God's goodness is generationally transferable. So, so right here, what, what he's basically saying is like, we will pass down to those who go after us, to our children, or maybe those that we walk with or have influence over, like we will pass down to the next generation and the next generation, the good things that God did among us. Us. And it will build on itself and it will build on itself and it will build on itself and God's faithfulness will just be, begin becoming more and more apparent. He says in verse four, one generation shall commend or, or share or offer your works to another. Like, like we'll, we'll highly suggest you look at this, like, like this is what God did and, and they shall declare your mighty acts. Like we will tell people what God did in our life. And so often we talk about how maybe you can give your kids your money, but the question is, what about your faith? What about the goodness of God and the good things that he's done in your life? You know, we always say, you know, you can pass your money down, but you can't take it with you. But God's goodness and your experience of his glory in your life, you can take it with you and you can transfer it to the generations that come after you that God's goodness is generationally transferable. Everything that God has ever done in your life, every good thing, every miracle, every faithful moment, every promise, your love for him, your love for the word, your love for his ways can all be transferred to the generation after us if we will commend what God did in our life to them. I had a really cool idea this week and something that I want to do one day. I mean, it's, just what David does here, but it's like, imagine if you wrote down maybe like a, a short essay or a short book or something just for you, just for your family. And what if you wrote down every good thing God ever did in your life or the highlights or the moments when he was the most faithful, the, the moments when he came through, when he blessed you, when, when God comforted you in the pit, like, like every good thing God ever did, and you wrote it all down and you gave it to your kids. Or you gave it to maybe someone who you have influence over or someone you want to bless. And they can read and see what God did in your life. Like his glory can be transferable from person to person to person. It's like God does something powerful in your life. This is why like testimonies are such like miracles is because whenever you have a testimony of what God did, like you ever heard someone else's testimony that blessed you? Like, that's amazing. God is so good. Christ is awesome. Like, that, that's, that's life change. It's amazing. And, and what God did in your life is now encouraging, like, a lot of other people. 
that like what God does in my life can bless so many other people and that I can generationally transfer his goodness from generation to generation. So God is not only the, the, the good king and he's not only good all the time, that he's not only endless goodness that I personally will never be able to fully comprehend, but that everything that he does in my life I can transfer to other people to bless them and they can bless others. And can you imagine almost like the, the glorious snowball that builds up over time when generation after generation is writing down the faithfulness of God. And what if like you wrote down stuff and then the next generation, they added on to it and eventually you have this whole thing of this generation of like all the things that God did and you're always handing it down. That's what they would do in the Old Testament. So not only does God bless us, but those blessings can be the blessings of so many other people. That is incredible. And so as we draw to a close today, I hope this time is, man, just help reorient your mind, get it off all the negativity for a while and consider what is truly good and perfect. I even feel it in my own soul, just like happier, just, just more optimistic. Like I'm, I'm looking at the right thing. And though it is amazing to meditate on God's goodness and it's amazing to study it, I will admit there is one problem. It's great to know that God is amazing and perfect and his nature is always good in every single way. But I think if we're honest, it also kind of scares us. (laughs) Because here's the problem. God is glorious and always good. but we are not. And I don't know about you, but even as I'm looking at all these things and and, and reading all these things, like kind of my insecurity begins to rise up. Like he is so perfect and clean and holy and I am so unclean. He is so faithful and I am so faithless. So there's this unworthiness that we can begin to feel there, there's this, this sense of um, that, you know, if, if he is this good, really, if God is really this good, if he's really all good, if he's really perfect, he's really holy, he's really glorious, if he's all these things for all eternity, then there is no way that that God could actually tolerate my sin, my problems, my failures, and my pride. <laughs> if he's that good, how could he tolerate my imperfection? (laughs) But as if it couldn't get any better, that problem leads us to our last trait of God's glorious nature. That our God who is perfect, amazing, holy, glorious, always faithful, always with us, always providing for us, always perfect and giving us everything that we need, that God is also, read verses eight and nine, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and and hear this, and his mercy is over all that he has made. That God is real. Bible tells us that God is real, but, but he's not just real, he's more than that. He's not just real, he's glorious, he's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous. So we don't just have a God that exists, we have a good God, a perfectly good God that exists, but he's actually, even more than that, he's also merciful. When we fall short of that, 
that God is holy and perfect and glorious and he creates us to know him and to love him and we are called to be the same but then we sin and we ignore him and we rebel and we belittle him and we don't give him his due and we don't worship him and worship ourselves or other people. We have egos and selfishness and all this filth because we rebel against him because we don't trust his ways even that he's good and he created us and he created this world but we ignore it and we sin and he's holy and we're unholy and the question is there's how could he ever tolerate us because let's be honest if you were God if I was God I wouldn't tolerate that I'd be like, forget you. But thankfully, I'm not God. Because that holy, glorious, and perfect God, he is merciful over all that he has made. And the Bible says that his mercy is shown fully in Jesus Christ, who was God, who came into the world in human flesh, who lived a perfect life among us that we were supposed to live, and he went to the cross and he died on the cross for your sins and for mine because here is the problem. When God forgives us, God is also still just. We want to just God, meaning God is always perfect, but we also want a forgiving God who's going to make mistakes. So the problem is we want justice, but if there's justice, the Romans says the wages of sin is death. So when you make a mistake, when you walk away from life, you enter into death. So if we've all made mistakes, then if we want justice, that means that someone has to pay the penalty for that thing that you did. Someone has to pay for that. And if we were to pay for it, it would be eternal death. But the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that God came into the world in Christ, that he would die on the cross for us and rise again to new life, showing that he had overcome Satan, sin, and death. And that if we will simply turn to him and place our faith in him, we will be forgiven forever and we'll spend eternity with him. So God is not just glorious and holy and perfect. He is also merciful when we are not. He is that good. And you don't get that in this broken, messed up, sinful and selfish world. I was reading this article or the story a couple weeks ago about this, like this woman who like, like led a charge to get like somebody else like fired because they did something wrong and they weren't worthy or qualified for it anymore and like was like celebrated. But then turns around, she was doing the same stuff and two weeks later, some stuff came out about her and then they canceled her and she had to step down. And it's like, it's like everyone's trying to get everybody else. And I don't get it because we live in a world where like supposedly all this is about equality. We're all supposed to be equal. But then when someone makes a mistake, all of a sudden, are they, are they less equal? So now we've got to get you, we've got to get rid of you because you're not as good as me. Like, well, you're not good for my status, so you gotta get out of the way, but we're all equal. So are, are we equal or are some better than others? And it's like, whenever the world figures that out, let me know, because it doesn't make any sense to me. Because the reality is, is the world that we're so often looking at, it's not good because we all have sin. We've all made mistakes. All of us are unqualified. We've all, listened. if everyone knew everything about us, we wouldn't judge anybody else. It's like when, that when they, the Pharisees brought the woman who was caught in adultery before Jesus, and they said, well, you're this holy, perfect teacher, right? You, you want good things and good morality. Well, this woman was having an affair and being adulterous. And so they throw her in front of Jesus and, and they want Jesus to stone her. So these other sinners are standing around saying, stone this woman. She's not good. She's morally unclean. And Jesus says the famous line where he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And we live in a culture in a day that is so far from God that we just want to stone people because you're not good and you're not righteous and, and you're a bad person. I'm a good person, but you're a bad person. And we stone people and we mob people. And yet deep down, we all know we're all sinful and messed up too. And Jesus is speaking to us today. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Because we live in a time where the demonic spirit of self-righteousness is running rampant. But it's always been this way. 
And so we are not a forgiving people and we are not a holy and clean, perfect people because we've all made mistakes. And yet God is perfectly just and perfectly good, but he's also the one who is merciful. And that is the wonder of the gospel of which this world knows nothing about. But for those of us who have given our lives to Jesus, we see it so clearly. Listen, this world is broken, it's sinful, it's messed up. And we don't just complain about that. We set our eyes on Jesus, the fullness of God and his goodness, who is perfectly just, perfectly fair, but also merciful and loving and forgiving and redemptive when we fail because we all fail. If you're watching this right now and you don't know if you're a Christian, I invite you to put your faith in Jesus today. Do not wait. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. The Bible says it's appointed once for a man to die or a woman to die and after that we face the judgment. And that for those of us that come to Christ, we are forgiven. The core message of the Christian faith, it's not religion, it's forgiveness. And God invites all of us to come because none of us are worthy in and of ourselves. We act like we are, but we're not. We've all made mistakes. We're all sinful. We're all broken. There's not bad guys and good guys. We're all in this together. We're all the bad guys. You know, like, it's just like people don't know everything about us yet. Like, that's the only difference. And so I invite you to place your faith in Jesus, the Redeemer and the Forgiver. And as we finish today, I'm just gonna pray this prayer wherever you're at. Um, if, if you wanna pray this prayer with me and then you can reach out to us, you can email us, you can comment here on the video and let us know that you gave your life to Jesus today and you wanna grow in your faith and you wanna grow in your walk with God. We will follow up with you. And we will walk with you in this life. Let's pray this time. Father, I come before you today and I see your glory. I see your holiness. But I confess that I'm a sinner. That I have fallen short of your glory. And I confess that. But I come to Jesus today. I place my faith in you. I give my life to you and I believe in your good news of forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. I love you, Jesus. Amen.